show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And today is our special edition of Microbial Birthday Bash. Yay! If you're a December baby, happy birthday to you. I'm sure you'll be delighted to know December is the month of microbial geniuses. There are so many brilliant microbiologists born in December. If you've been following on our Twitter or Instagram, then you also know that November 30th, not quite a December baby, but close, Lorenz Hitler was born in 1862. Do you know what his claim to fame was, John? No, I don't. I actually don't recognize that name. What is his micro moment? Well, he coined the term rhizosphere back in 1904. The rhizosphere is the bit of soil surrounding plant roots. It's chock full of microbes that usually confer beneficial qualities to the plant. Kind of like our own gut microbiomes, but for the plants. Right. Then there's Fanny Hess, Gladys Dick, Abigail Slayers, and a whole slew of others I'm sure we are forgetting. Oh, and not to mention the two people we are going to be talking about today. Only the biggest names in microbiology, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, were both December babies. And the topic of today's podcast. But first, John, do you want to give us the first hint of our mystery micro moment? Sure. If you are new to the show, the mystery micro moment works like this. We'll give you three clues throughout the episode of a famous person's micro moment. And if you know the answer, let us know by sending us an email at microbigels at gmail.com or on Twitter at microbigels. Okay, now for clue number one. Ooh, I'm excited for this one. Who you got? I can't tell you, but I can give you the clue to the person. Yeah, let us know. This person attended Hunter College and initially wanted to study French or literature, but decided to switch their field to study biochemistry against the recommendations of professors who felt women struggled to get a career in science. Mm. That didn't stop them as they ended up getting their PhD at the University of Wisconsin. Okay, so I got an American woman who became a microbiologist. Clue number one. Right. Any idea? Yeah, I got a few ideas. All right. We'll save that for later, though. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. We're going to talk about Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur. And, uh, John, I was just hoping you could tell us what book you read or, or sources you used to study or to learn about Robert Koch's life? So I mostly got this information from the book Robert Koch, Father of Microbiology by David C. Knight. And I will say that it was published in 1961. Okay. It was the only book I saw, or I could find, I should say. But I should note that there are some outdated things in this book. For one, the author keeps calling bacteria little plants. <laughs> They do not. They're not. It's 1961. They know what bacteria are. What's wrong with him? They are completely different domains of life. Bacteria are in the domain bacteria, while plants are in the domain eukarya. This is 1961. I don't understand. I don't don't know. It it doesn't make sense to me either. I mean, they must have rearranged uh, the kingdoms at some point. But also, just as a side note, Coke also used chlorinated mercury or mercuric chloride as a topical disinfectant. Does that mean he became a mad hatter? No. So I guess this was started in the Middle Ages, and it was used all the way up to Coke's time. But of course, it has mercury, and it's highly toxic. Right. So you're saying he went crazy? He didn't go crazy? He didn't didn't go crazy, luckily. I I just thought it was something pretty interesting. Mm. That kept popping up throughout the book. Interesting indeed. Um, so I read the book called Louis Pasteur by Harvey Warren, um, who did a little biography about Louis Pasteur, and I'll give you the highlights here today. And so, John, I was wondering if you could just sum up Robert Koch in a sentence or two. What would you say? What was your your feeling of the essence of Robert Koch when you're reading the book? Um, a very strong drive to further science. Mm. Mm-hmm but also childish at times. (laughs) We'll get into that a little bit, I'm sure. We sure will. What about you? Can you sum up Pasteur in one sentence? So it definitely seemed that Louis Pasteur was a pretty well-respected man during his time. He wasn't one of those like starving artist type or scientists that 
were uh, more well known after they're further in their career, it always seemed like he was getting lots of awards and recognition. So it seemed like he was well respected and dignified in his field throughout his entire career, which I think is kind of cool and interesting, but also a little silver spoon baby in some ways. He was just right place at the right time. So speaking of time, we are speaking of 1822 as when Louis Pasteur was born on December 27th. So towards the end of his life. Oh, that means that he's what? Almost 199. Yeah. He'll be he'll be 200 years old next year. Oh, we should have done this next year. Well, we'll revisit <laughs> Pasteur again in 2022, I suppose, as well. So Louis Pasteur was born in France in 1822. And so I want to just give people a little bit of um, when we are in history. So we're talking about the mid 19th century to the early 20th century. We were talking about after the Napoleonic Wars, during the American Civil War, but before World War I. From a scientific point of view, we're talking the time when Darwin published his theory of evolution, which occurred in 1859. We're talking a time when antiseptics and anesthesia were just starting to be used. And if you're more on the pop culture side of things, uh, we're talking a time when Queen Victoria was on the throne. Walt Whitman was writing Leaves of Grass. Mark Twain was writing Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Frederick Douglass was leading the American abolitionist movement. Edison was working on his light bulbs. Karl Marx was getting into communism. Henry David Thoreau was sitting in a cabin uh, in Massachusetts writing Walden. Marie Curie was even born during this time. However, her claim to fame with discovering radium and polonium comes a bit after. We have Fyodor Dostoevsky, one of my favorite authors of all time, publishing Crime and Punishment. We even have P.D. Barnum uh, running around in a circus and singing songs and stuff. So, I mean, hopefully there's something in there that kind of orients you to what time frame we're talking about. This is a pretty turbulent time in history, I think. Lots are going on. It certainly was. I know a lot happened, but that little quick summary was like very intense. <laughs> there's yeah, there's there's a lot going on. So I think it's it's kind of important to understand that whenever we're doing biographies, everything is not in a vacuum. Everything is kind of happening while every and and even I mean I was listening to a podcast last night about the Statue of Liberty, which came uh, into existence during this time as well in in the harbor of New York. Um, so yeah, there's just lots of things happening during the lifespan of Louis Pasteur. So what we're going to attempt to do in this podcast today is go through both people's lives chronologically and kind of come up with the highlights and how their lives paralleled each other. Um, they, they did exist at the same time, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, but Louis Pasteur was born first. So I'll start with him and then John will interject every once in a while uh, when Robert Koch has a famous thing that happened with him. Um, so Louis Pasteur had an older sister and two younger sisters as well. His father was a third generation tanner. Um, so I bet you his father was a little mad when he didn't go into the family business. But growing up, he was nicknamed the artist because he was always drawing and he's quite talented with pastels. He was not super great in school as a in um, grade school, but he did end up having some teachers that thought that he had a lot of potential and encouraged him to go to university and, and to seek education further in Paris. He was quickly grew homesick in Paris, um, but he knew that that was the place he needed to be in order to get the education that he needed. So he moved to Paris. He became a teacher and part-time student. In his spare time, he would attend lectures of the great chemist Jean-Baptiste Dumas. At this time, he received several awards and distinctions. Like I said, he was getting awards and distinctions like all throughout his life. So he was just always very well recognized as being a genius. He was known as a grave, quiet, rather shy, but obviously brilliant and very determined, hardworking person in the scientific spheres. So in 1848, France went through a great revolution and Louis forgot about his studies for a time, joined the National Guard and donated his entire life savings to the Republic. But he was still teaching and studying chemistry intently. That's some national pride right there giving all your savings up like that? Oh, wait, there's an even bigger uh, national pride moment in Louis Pasteur. He was very much um, a French patriarch. He, he loved, he loved France. So that's the first 26 years of Louis Pasteur's life in which Robert Koch was born. Robert Koch was born in 1843 on December 11th. 
He was the third son of Herman and Mathalai Koch, and his father was a miner who eventually became the advisor of mining affairs in Prussian government. And you'd think with a position like that, they'd be a relatively wealthy family, right? It's a high, um, high office. However, they were quite poor because he was one of 13 children. Oh, wow. That's a lot of brothers and sisters to keep track of, to feed, get Christmas presents for. Yeah, the book said that they only got meat twice a week with bread being the main food staple in the household. Wow. So Robert had a particular interest in nature. He would collect insects and plants, and he liked to examine moss and lichen with a magnifying lens. Oh, and lichen. I didn't know they knew about lichen, like, way I don't back know then. if they knew about it being... He was just looking at moss, and he was like, this is a little different than the other moss. Yeah, he's like, hey, this is pretty cool looking. It's like whenever we go hiking, you take a bunch of pictures of lichen. Oh, my God. We never get through a hike. It's it's bad. It's very true. <laughs> but Coke did very well in school, and he excelled in the science math, and he knew several languages. Despite this, it didn't seem that he would go to university at first. Why? Because his family didn't really have money. However, they did inherit some property, and that allowed him to go to university. Oh, that's nice. So he, he was like a lifelong scientist, like from his childhood, he was like interested in insects and moss and took all the science classes. Yeah, this was his passion. It wasn't specifically, you know, microbiology at first, but it was just like nature and bi biology. He was like, I love this stuff. This is my life, hands down. And he went to University of Göttingen, where he studied medicine. And he was influenced maybe by... Maybe Gutengen. I feel like the Germans is always Guten. Maybe, maybe it's Guten. It has that O with the two dots over it. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe it is Gutengen. And he was also influenced by Jacob Helm, who wrote a book on contagious diseases, where he wrote two interesting things. And let me know what you think of these. First, a person infected with a disease can give it to another, either by direct contact or with another person, or by coming contact with an object of an infected person has touched. Also, before microscopic forms can be regarded as a cause of contagion in men, it must be constantly found in the contagious material. They must be isolated from it and their strength tested. Hmm, that sounds like the very first version of Koch's postulates, huh? It sounds just like Koch's postulates. And I saw that and I'm like, hmm. hmm. So what year was that? That was around 1866. So he graduated. Oh, you're way ahead. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just uh, that that was his university life. So I was going to stop right there so we can move on. Yeah. Well, now we have to go back 20 years, <laughs> back to 1848 with Louis Pasteur. So Louis Pasteur actually was not into microbiology or biology in the beginning days. He was interested more in chemistry, particularly in crystals. He soon became a professor of physics at Lycée in Dijon in November of 1848, but soon moved to be a professor of chemistry at Strasbourg. Then he met a girl named Marie Laurent. So two weeks later, he proposed to her. Like, how quickly? It's so fast to know that you're going to spend the rest of your life with someone. Sounds like a Las Vegas wedding. Oh, indeed. I bet you they had an Elvis impersonator uh, <laughs> as their officiant and everything. So they were married in 1849, and his wife uh, was very supportive of his studies from all accounts that I could find, which I think is really important because it seemed like he was traveling a lot for work over the course of his career as well. So his work even received a red ribbon of the Legion of Honor in 1853. His father also received this ribbon um, for different things, obviously, uh, from Napoleon Bonaparte. So now we'll get into how Louis Pasteur went into microbiology. So in the 1850s, he started to look at sour milk, how it was yeast that did this, just like in beer. He discovered that although he was a great chemist, he was not a match for the greatest chemist in the world, which is, of course, microbes. By the late 1850s, he started to work on the problem of spontaneous generation of microbes, which is the concept that microbes spontaneously generated from non-living dirt or dust. 
Today we know this is totally bogus, but at the time it was the prevailing thought. So we set out to work to try to disprove this theory. You want to know how Louis Pasteur defunct the idea of spontaneous generation? I do. Lay it on me. Do you know already? I, I do, but it's still pretty cool. So he took 250 cubic centimeter flasks with swan neck tops and filled them with a suspension of yeast and water. Okay, so you got that image now? It's a sterile swan filled with water and yeast. He then boiled the water, essentially killing the yeast. So now it was a swan filled with water and dead cells and sealed off half of the flasks. The other half, he broke off the necks of one group, exposing it to air. This group grew microbes. The other that was sealed and not exposed to air did not grow anything. They were still sterile. There was no spontaneous generation in the closed flask. So he concluded that microbes did not arise from spontaneous generation, but from contamination from the air. I just like that experiment because it's so simple, but it's so important. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these experiments back in the day, they were so simple, but so revolutionary. I, I suggest that everyone just takes a look at the illustrations of it. it. I don't know, just something about the flask. It just looks really cool to me. <laughs> it's got that old school antiquity look to it yeah exactly yeah i can see that so in 1862 louis pasteur was elected to the academy of science this was his second try so he did a lot better than alexander fleming did i can't remember how many times it took alexander fleming but i i want to think it was like four or five or something <laughs> they would not let that kid in very strict rules there Mm -hmm. So you have to just do a lot, impress a lot of people to get into there. So he also got into wine during this time and was like, wine has a lot of diseases. But if you keep it, if you boil it for a short time or raise the temperature of wine to a short time to 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, then the diseases could be prevented. And thus uh, comes to be the moment that everyone knows Pasteur for, the first example of pasteurization, for which we don't do to wine anymore, but it does happen to it's like every milk unless you get the milk straight from the farm, right? Exactly. So Robert Koch is still going through university when Louis Pasteur in 1865 sets out to cure another pandemic. So a pandemic would arise in 1865 that could alter the course of our history. This disease was called pebrine, and it was the French word for pebre, meaning pepper, because the disease would give its victims tiny dark spots like pepper all over the body. It started in 1849, and by 1865, populations wiped out and industries were nearly brought to ruin. Well, one industry, really. Do you know what the pandemic was? Actually, I've never heard of this disease before, so I'm completely in the dark with this. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all because it's a disease of silkworms. So by 1865, only Japanese silkworms were safe, and every other silkworms population were in terrible trouble. They all had this disease, and silk is obviously a very precious commodity um, for clothing and a lot of other attributes during this time, and even today. So to have... Uh, this pandemic go across, it's going to rise the prices of silk, it's going to make things less obtainable to a lot of people. And of course, that's going to affect people's lives. But have no fear for Detective Louis Pasteur is here. Although when he started this work, he actually had a very traumatic event happen to him. His daughter, who was only two years old, passed away. But nonetheless, he worked in order to try to solve this pandemic for the greater good. And so what he did is he got a set of non-diseased silkworms to compare with the diseased ones. But germ theory was nearly begging Pasteur to discover it, because in 1865, another pandemic would plague the French that year. This, of course, would be where we make our cholera call-out of the episode. The October... Oh, here it is. <laughs> and I think you have some cholera stuff too, right? Shh, it's coming up. <laughs> Always cholera. So in October 1865, cholera outbreak would have nearly 200 people dying daily. He formed a team to try and see if they could link the disease to a bacterium, but were not successful at first. Pasteur was really being pulled in all sorts of directions to study various things at this time, from having dinner with the emperor to trying to solve the silkworm pandemic to trying to link cholera disease to a bacterial agent. Quite the busy man. 
all while grieving for his father who passed away and his daughter who died at such a young age. Oh, and also during this time, another daughter of his, Cecile, age 12, died of typhoid fever. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, he had a, um, a lot of tragic micro moments in his life before he got to some good micro moments in his life. Do you think that was like for the rest of his life, his main driving force was that? I, oh, yeah, there's definitely some points where he, I think, stems from that grieveness, from that tra- trauma, and moves into medical microbiology. Um, but he hasn't quite moved there first. There's one more traumatic event that needs to occur in Louis Pasteur's life um, before he'll officially move into medical microbiology. I don't know. I'm a little reluctant to hear another bad story. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay, so while working on the silkworm problem, Pasteur proposed this novel idea. So this is in 1865 still. He was like, wait, wait, what if this disease is infectious? Like you can transmit the disease to other healthy silkworms through direct contact with a diseased silkworm. Or like if healthy worms eat sick worms poop, then they can get it that way too. So maybe if we just stop having silkworms that are sick next to healthy silkworms, um, we can prevent this pandemic from continuing to wipe out the silkworm industry. A very novel idea. That sounds kind of like germ theory to me, too, which definitely leads into Robert Koch's think Koch's uh, postulates, I think, as well. It does. It does. Oh, yeah. So also during this time, he was writing uh, his book on why to pasteurize wines. He was the youngest member of the Academy of Science. He gave lectures on how fungus Mycodermia acidia could grow in wine, cover the surface, absorb oxygen from the air, and transform the alcohol into acetic acid or vinegar. While water into wine sounds a bit better than wine into vinegar, I'm still going to call Mycodermia acidia the Jesus microbe. What do you think? (laughs) All right, I got your back on that one. Nice. He even got a little political, leveraging his ties with the emperor to build a bigger, better laboratory and advocate for funding for science. During this time, Germans at the University of Bonn even bestowed upon Louis Pasteur an honorary medical doctor degree. And he got many other awards and recognitions, including a special grand prize medal at the World's Fair in Paris in 1867. So do you have anything from 1867 to 68 for Robert Koch? I do. So there's not a whole lot that happens with Robert Koch during this time. He graduates from university, and he's kind of floating around for a couple of years. And it doesn't really end till 1872, but we'll get to that, that point where he's getting jobs as a physician here and there. But really, the big thing is... Did he go to medical school? Yes. He specialized in, in medicine eventually. And um, the biggest thing here was he married Emmy Fretz in July of 1867. And they had grown up together, and they had played together since they were kids. Aw, love, love. And as they got older, she would listen to him about science while they took strolls in, like, the garden. And she would collect samples from him so he could look at it under his microscope. Oh, my God, that's so cute. Oh, it gets cuter. It's it's going to get cuter. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm ready. And so during this time, she would save up all her free money, and she bought him a new microscope. Aw, that's so cute. Yeah, because the one he had at that time had a scratch in the lens. Uh-huh. And so she saved up her money so he could get a brand new one for him. Oh, man, the greatest love story ever so yeah. far. That That's pretty much what happened so far in his life is... He's, he's jumping around. He's, you know, trying to work as a physician. And he gets married to his uh, childhood love. That's adorable. All right. Ready for some more tragedy and the Louis Pasteur story? Oh, come on. I just gave a nice story. <laughs> you can't drag us down to another tragedy with that. Oh, I got two, actually. So I'll drag you down and then drag you down. Oh, fine, fine. Okay. So on October 19th, 1860. Eight. Pasteur was feeling quite unwell. He had a, a tingly sensation in the left side of his body, which I mean, I had once too, but turned out to be shingles, much better than what happened to Pasteur. He was suffering from a cerebral hemorrhage that left the left side of his body in paralysis. 
and he was home, he was bedridden for about three months, but constantly hoped he could get back into the lab. It was like such a driving thing for him. Like, I think that's probably the reason that saved his life was just having this urge to get back in the lab and to continue his research. And not to mention like a cerebral hemorrhage. That is a very dangerous thing. Like he's lucky he survived that. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and he he lived um, a long time after having the cerebral hemorrhage. But yeah, it's such a an intense thing to happen to you. And he still had so much more to give the world. So just keep that in mind that everything that from this point on happens after the fact that he lost the left side of his body for a long time um, from a cerebral hemorrhage. Eventually, he did get some movement back into the left side of his body uh, and was able to continue his work and go back into the lab. But first, we have um, the Franco-Prussian War, which is another traumatic event in Louis Pasteur's life. So the Franco-Prussian War happened between 1870 and 1871. And this was a pretty nasty war that greatly uh, affected France as a whole. So it, it's actually in 1867, three years before the war, that Le Sieur published his landmark paper on the antiseptic principles in the practice of surgery, which he developed based on Pasteur's teachings, which I think is kind of cool. But unfortunately, I think uh, Lister was in Scotland. Does that sound right? I think so, yeah. So it did not reach France in time for the Franco-Prussian War. So there's still a lot of people dying just because of poor surgery and hospital practices. And I also think it's kind of interesting in this time, we are about 20 years after the Crimean War, which is when Florence Nightingale was around doing stuff. So it's like basically everything amazing in microbiology happened during this time. The fledgling field of microbiology is growing out of this. Yeah, yeah. It's really the birth of uh, medical microbiology is happening. I think it's so cool. So Louis, Louis Pasteur, with his intense French pride, of course, wanted to go to the war and fight for his nation. But his paralysis was obviously not going to be great in the war. So he didn't end up going. But he did find a way to still burn the enemy in a very intellectual way. He wrote to the University of Bonn, who years earlier gave him an honorary degree, and he said, my conscience calls on me to ask you to remove my name from the archives of your faculty and to take back the diploma as a symbol of the indignation inspired in a French scientist by the barbarity and hypocrisy of the man who persists in the massacre of two great nations in order to satisfy his criminal pride. He sent his degree back. Wow. He was like, no, thank you. That's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, man, what a bird, huh? Yeah. He still found a way to... <laughs> it's a very elegant burn, I must add. Very, very elegant burn. So Louis always had an affinity for fermentation. And so after the war, he went back and decided to work with beer. He already did sour milk, he did wine, and now it's time to move to beer. And this sparked a controversy with Justice von Liebig, who didn't think microbes were the greatest chemists in the world, and he didn't think they were responsible for turning grape juice into wine or water into beer. But obviously, we remember Pasteur, not Liebig, and we have this podcast, so I hope it's pretty obvious who is right in this argument. <laughs> it was during this time... It was during this time he laid down some pretty fundamental laws of nature that is pretty common knowledge of today. One microbes cause fermentation. Two, different microbes produce different fermentations. For instance, Pasteur said Mycoderma vini turned grape juice into wine, while Mycoderma acidi had the power of turning wine into vinegar. And three, microbes are not the product of spontaneous generation, but come from other microbes that already exist. So you got anything in the uh, 1870 to 1873? This week's episode of The Micro Moment is brought to you by Zymo Research. Accurate and reproducible microbiome analysis relies on well-defined mock community standards as well as optimized methods for sample collection, nucleic acid extraction, library prep, and bioinformatics. 
Check out Zymo's complete microbiome workflow at zymoresearch.com. That's Z Y M O R E S E A R C H.com. The only thing I have for Robert Koch is he was also in the Franco-Prussian War. Oh, yeah? What did he do? Did he fight? No, he's a physician for the Franco-Prussian War. Ah. He had a sense of, like, I don't know. No, it wasn't a sense of nationality. He had some, but it was also adventure, because actually before he tried to enlist, but since there was no war going at the time, he was turned away. But, you know, Franco-Prussian War is like, yeah, I want to go, and I want to go see the world. And so he became a physician, but it, it wasn't for too long. I think it was maybe six months to a year that he was really a physician for the war. Mm-hmm. I mean, the war did not, that war did not last very long. No, it didn't. It was short and aggressive. When he left the military, he was offered the position of district physician of Wolstein in 1872. And this is really the first time where he wasn't bouncing around from position to position for a while like he landed here he he started to settle down yeah he did move on but this was the first place like he was able to sit down and have practice for a little bit well he's about 30 years old right so that's usually when people start settling down a little bit yeah at least in today's standards i don't know what happened back then i guess but and he had his practice in his house and he had an office to see his patients but he divided in half where one half is where he saw his patients, and then the other half, he had his homemade laboratory. So he made his own incubator, he had his microscope, he was studying microbes in that other half that he kept away from everyone. It's like, this is my special space. <laughs> it's always good to have a special space dedicated to just you. Mm-hmm. Oh, and he had a daughter at the time, too. Oh, I want a perfect nuclear family. They have a dog, too, and a white picket fence. No... They never mention any pets. Oh, well, yeah, they never do in these biographies. I mean, both Ru- Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur killed a number of animals. So I was gonna say he had a lot of animals, pets. but not as pets. They were used <laughs> for laboratory experiments. Right, right. But his first big discovery doesn't come till 1876, so we're just gonna have to wait a little bit. All right, we'll wait just a little bit longer, and we'll talk about how Louis Pasteur got into the medical field. So maybe it's just my today brain looking at Pasteur's yesteryear brain, but sometimes I think he must have had ADD with science projects because he's worked on basically everything. Uh, or, or I mean, maybe it's just because he's one of the only a handful of people that had any grasp on the field of microbiology because he worked on silkworms, he worked on sour milk, he worked on wine. But as soon as he settled the argument with Liebig, on why beer is the cause of microbes, and we should all love them. Um, <laughs> although I don't think that was Pasteur's exact words, but I think we should all love them. You're just paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing it all. Uh, he switched from beer to blisters. So Pasteur lived through a lot of trauma, as we've already talked about. He lived through wars. He had the loss of his daughters, his father. He had his own dance with death with his cerebral hemorrhage. It's easy to see why Louis Pasteur became interested in medical aspects of microbiology. But doctors at the time, um, except I guess Robert Koch had some affinity to it, but most doctors at the time were hardly scientific. In fact, they were very much poo-pooing a man of science and thought themselves as elitists, and scientists were kind of like failed physicians in some ways, which is 100% incorrect in my humble opinion. You tend to drift the opposite direction. I I tend to drift the opposite (laughs) direction, but, you know, that's just my opinion. At any rate, during this time, a lot of medicine was, um, you know, mostly just amputations was what everyone was doing. Everyone was getting their leg chopped off, and they were seeing how fast you could chop someone else's leg off or how many other people you could kill while chopping someone's leg off. But that's a story for another time. I mean, one doctor even said, too often when we decide upon an operation, we are just signing the patient's death warrant. So they knew, they knew that like, they're like, yeah, let's just do an amputation because it'll probably kill somebody, but like, whatever, maybe they'll survive. So uh, especially during wartime, I mean, they knew it wasn't good, but it's like, there's all these injured. We need to treat them somehow. What's the quickest method? Well, off with the, well, off, off with, with the, the arm or off with the leg. Yep. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, and they like, but they, without sterile technique, it would get gangrene, it would get infected, and then um, you'd have sepsis and you die. So, and a lot of like doctors at the time were very against um, kind of listening to scientists with like, maybe we should put clean bandages on people. Uh, maybe we should not ha use you know, that saw that you just cut off that other person's bone with to on this person, maybe, maybe it should be cleaned a little bit. But, you know, eventually we got there and it, things are a lot better today than they were in the 1870s. Um, it was even, I think this is kind of funny, uh, in this, during this time period, a doctor made a sarcastic remark about tuberculosis. And he was like, that thing's not caused, like tuberculosis isn't caused by a microbe. That's just totally absurd. He said, then all we doctors have to do is to set out nets to catch the germs of tuberculosis and find a vaccine. Uh, he said sarcastically. Uh. <laughs> to which, sir, I say, yes, that's exactly what you ought to do. Um, but, you know, he did not actually think the words that he was saying were true. Um, and tuberculosis is still a thing of today and an increasing subtle plague of humanity in a lot of overcrowded areas. The perfect breeding ground for tuberculosis. Indeed. So that brings us to 1873, where Pasteur may, did make a doctor friend who would believe in his science teachings. This doctor friend was named Alphonse Gurin, who took Pasteur's principles into hospitals. He decided to do something pretty novel. Ready for this? Very novel thing. Lay it on me. He washed a wound and covered it in a bandage and did not change the bandage for about 20 days. Whereas before, they were changing bandages about every other day, much more frequently, which, of course, exposes the wound to air and to people's skin microbes and increases infection rates pretty significantly. Due to this, less hazardous microbes got into wounds and infection rates dropped. You ready for this uh, survival rate? It's, it's probably going to be ri uh, a ridiculous difference, but let's hear it. Yeah, so he did this on 34 patients. 19 survived. Which, like, everyone was like, oh, my God, 19 people survived? That's fantastic. Like, we got to be doing this. This is wicked good. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that's not that's not great today. But back in the day, they're like, wow, we just saved, like, 50% of people? Hell, yeah. yeah. High fives all around. We're now gods among men. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways... Eventually, you know, more doctors were catching on. As we mentioned, Joseph Lister also took Pasteur's teachings into the operation room, um, and he was starting to use antiseptics as well. And both Pasteur and Lister, although they hadn't met uh, at this time, I don't believe, they were both advocating for this idea in different parts of the European nation, eventually convincing enough doctors until it became a thing. So... Jesus only took long enough. Yeah, it uh, took some time. But, but we got there. We got there. Actually, from what I've read, scientists slash physicians at the time were very hard headed. They were they didn't like to change their opinions no. that much. Yeah. Very stubborn. All right. So I know you have some stuff on this next session section because um, I know this is something that Robert Koch studied as well as Louis Pasteur. And this would be this would be what? This would be the disease of carbon, which has a different name today. Do you know what the name is? No, I have no idea what your disease you're talking about. So carbon was the name of anthrax back in the 19th century. They called the disease an element? I guess so, yeah. I don't really understand how it got carbon. Do you know why? No. No. Actually. Yeah. I'm not sure. Huh. We'll have to look that up. If anyone else knows, let us know. I'd be interested to find out why it was named carbon. So since Louis was like, I did the chemistry thing, I did the medical thing, we saved the silkworms, it was time to move into agriculture or help people look at the disease known as carbon, which we now know today as anthrax. So anthrax is a gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria known as Bacillus anthracis. It can form spores and be dormant in the soil for long periods of time. When activated, they come to life, able to reproduce and create toxins in whatever human or animal that they are in. This causes a severe disease that often leads to death. During pasture's time, some agriculture would have incidence of death between 10 to 15%, and sometimes even as high as 50%. 
So it's a pretty big deal and a need to be discovered. But also during Louis Pasteur's time, they didn't know what it was that caused this disease. So they didn't know anything about bacillus anthracis. So now most of the time, this is a problem for livestock. They're particularly cattle herders. Anybody who's in contact with cows or sheep could, could contract the disease. So cattle herders, farmers, butchers sometimes as well, tanners, people, even if you were using contaminated shaving brushes and you nicked yourself, you could get anthrax. And even in clothes, if they weren't decontaminated um, when they were created from the hide of the animals. So my microbe friends, this is actually where the word microbe comes from. It was during this time where Louis Pasteur was studying anthrax and studying this bacillus that he would coin the term microbe. And it's still something we use today, like all the time, like it's in our podcast name, the micro moment. Wow. Thanks, Louis. Well, I was not aware that he was the one that coined microbe. Yeah. So you want to talk a little bit about Robert Koch's anthrax or should I keep going? Do you have any more to talk about pasture and anthrax? I think I have a little bit more, yeah. Well, no, I guess I go into some other stuff. So why don't you talk about anthrax a little bit more? All right. So this, the year is 1876, and this is the point where Robert Koch makes his name. So it's interesting that they both kind of fell into anthrax around the same time, huh? Yeah. Well, the thing is, it seemed like this was sweeping livestock for a couple decades mm -hmm. at the point. So this is like really devastating to europe and so at the time farmers and like farm hands would like run to him and be like hey my sheep are sick and he would run over and he'd see one dead one sick and one healthy and he's like by tomorrow the one that's sick is dead and then the other one's gonna die eventually too and he would take blood samples of all the deceased and you know blood's red right well the blood samples were black ew that doesn't yeah. sound healthy and when he would look under the microscope, it'd be filled with these bacilli. Ah, and little rod-shaped bacteria swimming around in black broad. And from my understanding is this was a pretty quick disease. Like it, it replicated really fast and it killed quickly. And so when he was looking on the microscope, he saw little sticks floating in the blood. And like I said, some were rods, some were thread-like when they form chains. However, in healthy individuals, he could never find these structures. And some scientists had seen these structures in infected blood, you know, the little sticks, but couldn't directly tie it to disease or offer any proof of causality. So the question to Robert at the time was, if these rods are alive, how do I prove it? And he said, I need to see them multiplying. I need to see them growing in pure culture. Well, he had mice amongst many other animals in his lab. He wanted to see if he could transfer the disease first. So he would inoculate the mice with a little wooden sliver that he dipped in diseased material. Why did he use wooded, do you know? It may have been just easier to sterilize at the time, Cheap. like I don't, or cheaper, like, because mm. he wasn't getting any funding. So it may have been the easiest thing for him at the time. Unlike Louis Pasteur, who had the emperor in his pocket. Right. And so the next morning, the mouse would be dead. And he found, of course, these sticks or rods in their blood. He would then take the blood of that mouse and inoculate it into another one, using the same method over and over and over, repeating the process like 30 times, and all with the same result. But he still wasn't able to see the microbes grow. So he's shown that this is a transmittable disease, but is it alive? And at first, he was having trouble isolating the microbe as whenever he would try to grow it, it would be contaminated. He eventually came to this method where he gouged out a well in a thick glass slide, then sterilized a thin slide and added a drop of ox eye liquid. That was his growth media. Ox eye liquid, like yep, from a cow. Yeah. He then slid a bit of spleen from the deceased mouse and sealed the drop with the well of the thicker slide, isolating the specimen from the outside. With this method, he was able to see the rods divide and grow without any contamination. Wow, how do you even think of that? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I would never be like, oh, I know what I need. Ox eye liquid. Never crossed my mind. It was probably a long series of like trial and errors <laughs> until it was like, hey, look, this is growing stuff. Let's <laughs> go with this one. Yeah, yeah. So he was able to see the rods grow and divide. 
He then took a little bit of this growth and repeated this process more and more until he had a pure culture. And after he passes, he inoculated a mouse with this growth. And after 24 hours, the mouse was dead. He was able to see the rods in the mouse spleen again and repeating it over and over, still the same results. And it's sounding like Koch's postulates, what we'll get to earlier, uh, later in this podcast, but it's, it's pretty much being laid out right in front of us right now. Yeah. But there are certain conditions that bacteria would perish as fast as they would kill someone, and sometimes they wouldn't grow at all, and they were being killed from, like, sun rays. Koch then asked, how was it that these microbes survived in the environment? How is it that some fields, animals were fine and others were just dying? You know, it's the classic, that's the classic uh, meme about, you know, laboratory strains or in the wild or like freaking impossible. They're like superheroes and then you put them in the lab and they die all over the place. Exactly. So you need the perfect conditions in the lab to do your experiments, but in the wild, they'll kill everything. <laughs> Oh, it's so much harder in the lab, especially when you wanted to do it a, a particular thing. Microbes yeah. like, no, I don't feel like it. It's the truest meme of all time. It'd be one day that Coke would stumble on oval bodies present in one of his slides. And at first he thought that this was a contamination and he didn't give the slide a second thought. However, several weeks later, he saw the same ovals when looking at the slide again. He decided to add ox eye liquid and the ovals sprouted and started to grow again. And you would touch upon this. This meant that these microbes were forming spores, which explained how the bacteria survived in the environment. It protected them. So in the lab, when he was growing the cultures, if they were exposed to sun rays, they died. But if they're in spore form in the environment, they can survive it. It's a great survival mechanism. And these reconstituted microbes, he injected on mice. And what do you think happened? What happened? They died. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, scientists have seen the microbe but they had not seen the entire life cycle of Bacillus anthracis. Koch had identified the causative agent, agent of anthrax, seen the entire life cycle of the microbe, and showed that the disease was caused by a microbe. This was 1876, and Robert was 33 years old at the time. It was at this point in the book, I was, I was like Jesse Pinkman from Breaking Bad, and I was like, yes, yeah, science. Yes, yeah, science. <laughs> yeah, Mr. White. Yeah, Mr. White, exactly. And with these results, he wrote to esteemed Dr. Fernard Cohn of the Botanical Institute of Breslau, who was known as the greatest bacteriologist in Germany at the time. So Cohn invited Koch to the Institute in April of that year, where Koch presented his results over a three-day period. He demonstrated the results in front of Cohn, Julius Kohnheim. He was a pathologist who, among many other discoveries, pioneered the theory of inflammation. And at the end, many people congratulated him. They were very impressed with his work. And, you know, this was like his big break. He's like, wow, I guess I am really a scientist. <laughs> he was told to demonstrate it at this time also in front of Rudolf Virchow, who was at the time the greatest name in German medical science. And he actually advanced cell theory and cell pathology. However, he was a very distant person and very dismissive of Koch's results. And this is a pattern that will repeat over and over with these two people. Well, one of the people we remember and the other one's lost to history. So yeah, eat it. What's your face? It's kind of hurt Coke. You know, it's like, he's, you know, one of the heads of the field in Germany. And he's like, yeah, get out of my office. But undeterred, Coke published his findings and a year later published a paper on his methods of studying microbes. And it was at this time that he actually changed jobs. He was appointed the Imperial Health Officer in Berlin. Oh. He was given a lab and everything he needed. So he was given all the equipment he needed. It was no more homemade stuff. Nice. He was given two assistants, Friedrich Laufer and George Gafke. And these two would work, these two men would work with him and be lifelong friends with Aww. Coke for the rest of his life. So sweet. So what year are we in now? I'm going to stop right there because we're starting to get to the 1880s. Okay, cool. So I think it's time for our clue number two on our mystery micro moment, no? I think you're right. All right, here's clue number two. This person found a virus whose name is the 11th letter of the Greek alphabet, and its DNA integrates into the DNA of E. coli and dormancy 
only to come out and replicate in times of stress. This virus is used today to understand how genes are controlled and the exchange of DNA between organisms. Oh, I totally know who it is now. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Do you guys get it at home? If you do, let us know by sending us a Twitter or put a comment on Instagram. We'll put the, the clues up there as well so everyone can guess. Or, of course, you can send us an email to microbegals at gmail.com. And we'll finish up the 17 or sorry, 1870s here uh, with Louis Pasteur. So per usual, Louis Pasteur was everywhere doing everything. He spent some time in the laboratory. He spent some time in the hospital studying childbed fever. He worked on foul cholera on a farm. So there's another cholera call out for all those people keeping track at home. <laughs> and of course, he was looking at anthrax during this whole time. And, you know, we're in the 1870s. He was born in 1822. He now has grandchildren. He's getting up there in years. He's coming to the twilight years of his life and his career. But it was during this time when Louis Pasteur was studying foul cholera that he learned a very important lesson that we still use today. I mean, he taught us many lessons, but do you know what this lesson is, John? Um, honestly, I don't know because... I mean, we're, we're already pasteurization. He's already just made a lot of other discoveries. What else could he throw throw it on the plate? It's like Thanksgiving. All these servings of science discoveries. What else are you throwing on there? Yeah, I know. Like this dude just like just kept giving, giving and giving and giving to the scientific community, which is great. Okay, but first, before I tell you the lesson, I want to give you a little bit of background. So when he started working on fowl cholera, where fowl is not like fowl, like it smells bad, but fowl is in like the bird. Someone sent him a head of a rooster, as one does, you know, a little godfather <laughs> You know, as one does. I usually send two or three out a year to all you my know, friends. Heads of roosters, the godfather gift of the time. And he cultured the bacteria. So he's able to culture the bacteria by learning what kind of substance the bacteria likes to live on. And this is something that we're still always trying to do, even today, is figuring out what substances, what media, what ingredients what food microbes like to eat so that we can grow them and study them in the lab. So first he had to do that, which I imagine was significantly harder back then than it is today. But this is not the lesson that he teaches us. And in my notes, I, I, I put lesion, not lesson. So that's cool. <laughs> not the lesion he left for us. Well, uh, I mean, some of the stuff he worked with probably would give you a lesion. <laughs> Indeed. So he went on to study how the disease progressed in chickens. So then he wanted to know, well, if I infected a guinea pig, is the same thing going to happen? And he found that the guinea pigs did not develop a, as severe a, a disease as the chickens. They weren't affected the same way, a.k.a. the microbe caused disease in only some hosts. It had host specificity, which is also an important lesson, but not the lesson I'm getting at. So the lesson comes from an accident, like so many great scientific discoveries. And man, I'm just hoping to have a great scientific accident one day so that I can be on a podcast in 100 years from now with Louis Pasteur and Alexander Fleming. But anyways, it's not his accident, but someone in his lab's accident. So what happened was one of his lab assistants inoculated the chickens with a culture of foul cholera. But something strange happened. The chickens did not get that sick. And he wondered why, and what he discovered was that the culture that was inoculated the chickens was actually about a week old. All the other times where they were inoculating chickens, the cultures are only one or two year, two days old. Uh, so what happens when cultures are about a week old, John? Uh, a lot of the bacteria are dead, or they're in a protective state at that point in time. Exactly. So there was actually a weakening of the disease. I think if we had done that when we were getting our masters and PhDs, our PIs would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you can't make accidents like that anymore. No. Just like the Alexander Fleming accident. Can't do that anymore either. I mean, I think there's still some people that do stuff like that, but that's why I can't publish on it. You should see my lab sometimes. <laughs> so, um, so the microbes were weakened as they had uh, a longer time. And so then what he did was he put a stronger inoculum of foul cholera into the chickens, so fresh culture. 
and he waited for the chickens to die, but they did not. They did not die at all. It was as if their immune system was able to create a small amount of immunity towards the infection agent. And this, of course, is the basis of vaccines. With this knowledge, Louis thought, well, we could make vaccines for everything then, including anthrax and rabies and tuberculosis, just everything that plagues humanity. So he got to work. There are lots of vaccines to create. <laughs> That's an amazing discovery. You're right. It is a basis of like either inoculating with dead or not as strong microbes to give your immune system that little boost it needs to fight off any disease. Yeah, I was, you know, sort of surprised because like you think of Louis Pasteur, you always think of pasteurization, you think of wine, but you know, he did so much more than that. And he was everywhere all the time. And like, I feel like the vaccine portion would be more well known of his life, but oh. that's unfortunate. Yeah, and there's even a a, a more vac a, a bigger vaccine story that he's a part of. Uh, but first, let's have clue number three for our mystery micro moment. All right, our last clue is: This person found the fertility factor or genes that can be passed from one bacteria or another. But don't worry, this horizontal gene transfer is appropriate for all ages. <laughs> That was cute. Yeah, so Microbial Nation, that is the end of part one of the story of Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur. So if you know our mystery micro moment person, go ahead and send us a comment on Twitter or on Instagram. Or, of course, you can send us a Gmail to at microbegals at gmail.com and let us know who you think the mystery microbe moment is and if you enjoyed our little birthday bash episode part one head over to apple podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts and give us a review we would really appreciate it oh and one last thing before we go we're approaching our last podcast of 2021 still got a couple more weeks but we're almost there and we still need your help for our last the bomb we want to know what was the microbial breakthrough that got your jaw dropping that news story you had to share with your friends and family. Jump over on Twitter or Instagram or click the link in the show notes to cast your vote of your favorite micro moment of 2021. And we might feature it on our show and give you a little shout out. Hurry, polls close on the 10th of December. Okay, that's it for now. Until next time, we can't wait to see what your favorite micro moment is. And remember to keep those microbes happy this holiday season. Bye. Bye.